Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jim Falk, the Interim Executive Director of the Santa Fe Council on International Rel Relations. It's a privilege, a position I'm enjoying, but if you or you know someone who might be interested in coming to beautiful Santa Fe and being the permanent director, I wanna encourage you to go to our website to read the complete job position and make an application. I wanna give a special welcome to our friends over at the Santa Fe World Affairs Forum. They're our cooperating sponsor this evening, and we look forward to working with this organization in the future. Tonight, if you have questions, and I hope you will, just put them in the Zoom question box. And what I like to do is weave them into the conversation. So we'll be doing that throughout the next hour. Also wanna remind all of you, if you're not yet by chance a member of the uh, Santa Fe Council on International Relations, we're offering a special benefit this evening, 10% off on your membership to all new members. That'll give you discounts on programs, free programs, travel opportunities, and many other benefits. So if you have any questions about membership, just go to the website or give me or Shelley Winship a call. And an example of the type of programs that we do next Thursday, August 26 at 10 in the morning, we'll be having a virtual program, the State of the State Department with three of our local ambassadors, Ambassador Mark Asquino, Ambassador uh, Vicki Huddleston and David Killian, who was former US ambassador to UNESCO. And this will be moderated by Rebecca Black, who was a country director for USAID. And you can register for that program by going to our website. It is truly a special privilege for me to have my first program as interim executive director with a very dear friend, Ambassador Ryan Crocker. We've already sent to you his uh, a website, a link that goes into his full CV, but let me just highlight a few items that I think will interest you. In January of 2002, Ambassador Crocker reopened the embassy in Kabul. It was an embassy that had been shuttered after the Russian Soviet occupation by the Soviet Union and also the civil war that lasted for close to a decade. Then he came back to Afghanistan as US ambassador from 2011 to 2012. And one thing about Ambassador Crocker, and I'm sure it'll come across, he has a deep engagement and a visible commitment to fostering a more secure, tolerant and peaceful Afghanistan with opportunities for all, especially girls and women. And that's really an essential part of his being. He's also been known for his tireless work on behalf of our military forces, veterans, diplomats, and especially those who have been strong advocates to build a civil society in Afghanistan. And those are the ones now who are facing such, such an uncertain future. Ambassador Crocker, along with General David Petraeus, are on the advisory board of an organization that we'll be talking about tonight, and that is called No One Left Behind. So we'll learn a lot more about that in a few minutes. So one thing I've always wondered about Ryan is he served in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Kuwait, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. So the question is, ladies and gentlemen, does Ryan follow trouble or does trouble follow Ryan? As you might know, he's a good friend. We've been friends for over 15 years. And in 2012, Ryan invited myself and four of my colleagues in World Affairs Councils from across the country to come to Afghanistan. And it's really an example of how he operated. He wanted us to see the good, the bad, and also some uncertain. We met with the Minister of Education, the Minister of Energy, business folks, and lots of professors and strong journalists and women who are advocates for civil society. And so I know that he is feeling a lot of uncertainty and pain as we see what's happened in the last week. So with that, let me introduce one of America's most distinguished diplomats, Ryan Crocker. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. Good looking tie. Hey, and same to you. So, we must the same haberdashers. That's right. Must be a, a, a store in Dallas, Texas, where once I came. So I thought we'd begin by asking you, because there's such confusion, what is the origin of the Taliban? Well, the, um, the Taliban uh, emerged in the uh, fires of the Afghan civil war that began following the Soviet defeat and retreat. The only thing that had uh, held together the contending Mujahideen factions was a common enemy. So once that enemy was gone, the, the war was on. Now, 
The, the Taliban did not exist uh, at the beginning of the war, at least not in any organized fashion, uh, but they were able to pull together uh, what became the dominant force, uh, uh, effectively ending the war when they took Kabul in 1996. Uh, Taliban, of course, it means students, um, uh, and they adhere to a very rigid interpretation of, of Islam um, that uh, they use to justify whatever it is they want to do uh, in, in uh, full frankness. I mean, they are, not, uh, they are not a bunch of heavily armed religious scholars. Uh, they're, they're a bunch of heavily armed young men, many of whom do not read or write. So as they now retake the country for the second time, uh, uh, we are asking now that cosmic question, who, as Butch Cassidy queried the Sundance kid, who are these guys? You said they represent a certain school, conservative school of Islam. Is that Wahhabism or is it something else? Or what ties do they have to that? They style themselves, again, Taliban students uh, in, uh, in Pashto. Uh, uh, the, the truth is uh, most of them don't have any uh, deep views of Islam at all. Uh, would probably not know what the uh, four great schools of Islamic jurisprudence are. Uh, it was a, uh, a nice way to style themselves and then to interpret the faith uh, to allow them to do whatever it was they wanted to do. So uh, let's just say long on expediency, uh, a little short on doctrine. There have been a number of articles that I've seen in the last few days about the different individuals in the Taliban who are probably fighting among each other to see who's going to be the leader. I know one person who's been mentioned is Mullah Abdul Ghani Bahadar. Do you see him as the potential leader? And of course, at one point, our CIA forces were the ones working with the Pakistanis who put him in jail, in prison. Uh, yes, that is uh, correct. He was a co-founder, if you will, of the Taliban movement back in the 90s, along with uh, Mullah Omar. But there are far more questions here than there are answers. We don't really know uh, what linkage he has uh, <clears throat> from the Taliban offices in, uh, in Doha, Qatar, uh, uh, to the forces on the ground. And in a sense, uh, we... we <clears throat> kind of think that that may be less of a command line than, uh, than he might like to think. Our uh, uh, commander on the ground now, uh, a, <clears throat> a Navy SEAL, <clears throat> has initiated contacts with the Taliban that are right there. I mean, if we are going to be able to evacuate uh, our citizens, to evacuate those uh, individuals, <clears throat> who are special immigrant visa applicants, uh, <clears throat> they got to get through Taliban checkpoints. So he is talking to the folks on the ground. And I think in the process, we'll learn a little bit about how they're organized because right now we don't have a clue. And in truth, many of them don't have a clue, I would suspect. Let me remind our audience to not put their questions in the chat box, but in the Q&A box, please, because that's what I'm going to be looking for. What about Hamid Karzai? Years ago, you introduced us to him. And frankly, I was somewhat surprised that he wasn't on an airplane leaving the country. And he's been an intermediary now. Well, Hamid, Hamid Karzai is a <clears throat> complex individual, as are we all, of course. Uh, I, uh, I run counter to the prevailing sentiments in Washington, which is to not like Hamid Karzai very much, that he is critical, mercurial, uh, not really pro-American. I, I have a different view. Um, uh, he, he got to uh, Kabul about 10 days before I did at the end of uh, 2001 with the unbelievable task of putting the country back together. Uh, I, um, I admire his courage as I admire the courage, uh, especially of uh, Dr. Abdullah, who um, uh, is there with him in the palace with the Taliban. And then I the third uh, member of that little group is Gulbuddin Hikmatyar, uh, who um, uh, came in from the cold uh, several years ago, made his own deal with, uh, with Kabul and defected from the Taliban alliance. All, all three of those individuals for different reasons uh, uh, may be fearing for their life. 
um, uh, the Taliban could probably justify uh, killing any and all of them, and we'll see what happens here. Uh, but uh, if you're looking for any kind of silver linings, uh, let me assure you there are no silver linings, uh, but this may be one that is light black, uh, that they are engaged with the Taliban, and if the Taliban, dependent on what they choose, uh, this could prevent at least the worst of previous Taliban excesses, at least for the short term. So there's a leadership council of the Taliban of some 26 members. If it stays together, would, would that be the group that would select the leader? Well, I, I have no idea. And <clears throat> collectively, I think we have no idea. Uh, and they probably don't have much of an idea either. Uh, uh, as, as Americans, as Westerners, we, we tend to like to put little things in boxes and then connect the boxes to other boxes with, uh, um, uh, with dashed or straight lines. PowerPoint. Uh, uh, PowerPoint slides and so forth. Uh, that's not how the Taliban operate. Um, so the leadership council it may or may not have 26 members. It may or may not lead. Uh, but it is, uh, let me assure you, it is not like the corporate board of General Motors. So Roger asks, where does the Taliban get their funding? Uh, they have in the past, uh, during the time they, uh, they were ascendant, uh, got a lot of money out of the Gulf. Uh, uh, after 9-11, uh, after of course, we did everything in our power to shut down those kinds of financial flows. Um, but they probably socked away a good deal of, uh, of Gulf money. They made a fortune selling opium, uh, uh, an interesting way, again, of um, demonstrating their Islamic credentials. Quran is not noted for... Um, uh, hailing opium as the crop of choice, uh, uh, and uh, rackets, extortion, uh, uh, shaking people down at checkpoints. I mean, it went from retail to wholesale, uh, and that's uh, probably still pretty much the way they're operating. Are they getting their arms from Russia or somewhere else? Or Oh, my goodness, no. Um, uh, they had in the past, but right now, of course, they're getting their arms from the United States of America. I mean, the uh, Taliban. Well, I guess the Taliban's now getting them from the United I, I, States. That is what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, we are now uh, arming the Taliban to the teeth. Uh, if you've looked at those uh, videos of Kabul, you will see all kinds of um, uh, Taliban cruising around in um, uh, really nice Humvees and sporting um, M16 uh, rifles with scopes and uh, a lot of great hardware. So Carla asks, Carla McConnell, does the Taliban have the ability to run services, electrical, sewer, water, the basics of how a city functions? Again, we will see. They were, they were not noted um, for their uh, attention to services for their constituents during the five years that they governed uh, out, of, uh, out of Kabul. Uh, there are some indications that um, uh, that they may have learned from that experience. Uh, they have, for example, uh, issued public pleas to all Afghans, please do not leave the country. Uh, we, we have need of you here to, to build the, uh, uh, the rightful Islamic society that hopefully would extend to hot and cold running water, or at least running water of some form. Uh, but they haven't got a lot of record, uh, much of a record in doing those kinds of things. And, uh, uh, truth be told, the ones I've seen on the streets of Kabul don't look like they're um, really aspiring to be, say, plumbers. Right. No, it's hard to believe, but the Taliban, well, what was the date that you would say that the Taliban really was formed 30, 30, over 30 years ago, right? Well, in the early 1990s, yeah. Okay. So it's hard to believe, but it's true. I mean, it's more than a generation. And so is there a generational shift at all that you could perceive that this Taliban is different from the former Taliban? That's a question that came from Jerome Drujillo. And that is a very good question. Uh, again, as you look at the videos, you see that uh, uh, many, if not most, of the Taliban uh, on the streets of Kabul uh, would have no uh, personal memory of the, uh, uh, the days of Taliban rule. Uh, some of them would not even have been born. 
uh, when the Taliban were uh, forced into uh, exile by us. And it just, again, points us back to that question, who are these guys? Uh, and it, it raises questions for me. There's a clearly a generational split here between the older generation um, who uh, were part of the ascendancy, the first ascendancy of the Taliban, uh, and then went into a 20 year exile and the younger generation uh, uh, that I don't really have any insight into. Uh, but I would I, certainly it's a formula for deep divisions within um, the the movement, uh, and over time I guess we'll see those play out. So we have a question from someone both of us know very well at Virginia Beach, Maria Zamet. What do you think, and uh, certainly a leader in the World Affairs Council system in Hampton Roads, Virginia Beach. Maria asks, what do you think of the view that Pakistan intelligence service created the Taliban for their own leverage? Given your experience in Pakistan, would you comment on that relationship? Yeah, that gives me a chance to comment on other relationships uh, as well. Uh, you know, we kind of created this horrendous mess now in, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, good news is that on a key national security issue, there was actually a lot of uh, commonality and accord between President Trump and President Biden. Uh, the bad news is it was on Afghanistan uh, and the desire to rush for the exits uh, just to get the hell out of Dodge. Uh, President uh, Trump started it, of course, negotiating directly with uh, uh, the Taliban without the Afghan government in the room, uh, delegitimizing them, therefore. And President Biden, to my surprise, at least, uh, uh, embraced the uh, Trump policy and even kept his envoy, uh, Ambassador Khalil Zad. Uh, so that's why really we've got the problem uh, from hell right now. Uh, uh, you know, we, we aided and abetted, if you will, the, uh, uh, the return of the Taliban to power by, again, demoralizing and delegitimizing the government and the government's armed forces. Well, well President, Biden, formerly vice president, he was always taking a strong position. And wasn't there a dinner in Afghanistan where he walked out? And Well, there is, yes, the story of, of a dinner at the palace in Kabul in uh, 2009, in which apparently the vice, then vice president became so enraged that he uh, threw his napkin on the floor and stalked out of the room. Uh, as I said, people are complex and relationships are complex. It was that same Joe Biden who uh, 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 had me over for drinks at the vice president's residence in, in DC to kind of formally uh, ask me to go to Afghanistan and uh, for me to say I would be honored. Uh, he did not raise this uh, or deliver much of uh, an editorial on, on anything. When I uh, had my pre-deployment meeting with President Obama. Uh, he, was, he was there for that meeting. President Obama asked me to do two things, reset the relationship with Karzai and negotiate a long-term strategic uh, partnership agreement with Kabul. Well, both of those would have been rebukes to the vice president. Um, he, uh, he, he made no comment then uh, or later. I did not see him in Afghanistan. That, became the portfolio for Hillary Clinton, uh, who was a great, great boss, by the way. Uh, so who knows? Uh, uh, if he was um, intending from the beginning to uh, get us out of Afghanistan at whatever cost, certainly didn't show his hand at that time when, when I was on best. Interesting. Staying on Pakistan, I read an article today by Shashi Tharoor and I'm sure you know Shashi, but he's um, used to work in the United Nations and is now a member of parliament uh, in India and uh, just an incredible observer and writer about Indian politics. And he wrote this, the return of an Islamist Taliban regime in our neighborhood would definitely give Pakistan backed terrorists a base for attacks on India, as well as a source of ready recruits for the purpose. Pakistan Prime Minister Khan has already hailed the Taliban for breaking the shackles of slavery. How do you think Pakistan is, how does this affect Pakistan-Indian relations? 
Uh, well, uh, uh, it's hard to think of them as much worse than they already are. Uh, uh, you know, the end, we all need to take a deep breath here. Uh, you know, we are in uncharted waters and the stakes are very, very high. Uh, not to go into too much insider baseball, but uh, uh, the Pakistanis had worked very closely with the US during the Soviet occupation to uh, train, arm and equip Mujahideen to uh, carry the jihad uh, into Afghanistan and against the, uh, the Soviets. We were, we were partners. Um, after, after we succeeded, we left. Uh, and as we left, we let uh, sanctions come down on Pakistan for their nuclear program that we'd received exemptions for for a decade. Uh, so when I was ambassador to Pakistan, 0407, the narrative that they would retail as they got to know me was, hey, you left us, now you're back. You're back with uh, some cash. We'll take all you will give us. We will work with you against Al Qaeda, but we're not gonna work with you against the Taliban because um, we know what you're gonna do. You're gonna leave. You don't have the patience. That's, that's what we learned from you at the end of the 1980s and we think you're gonna do it again. And of course we've done it again. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I don't think that has led to a whole lot of high fives in the corridors of power in Pakistan, because this uh, uh, Taliban surge gives them the narrative that they, clad only in the armor of the one true faith, vanquished uh, the infidels on the field of battle. So that's a huge shot in the arm for uh, radical Islamic groups everywhere, and most especially in Pakistan where you have, among others, the uh, 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 Tariq Taliban Pakistan, the, the Pakistani Taliban that does not aim at uh, liberating Afghanistan, it aims at liberating Pakistan. Uh, uh, that plus the, uh, the so-called Kashmiri groups that Pakistan itself created at the time of a partition to put pressure on India, well, Pakistan has got to worry that they're now going to be aiming their guns at them, uh, thanks to the uh, impetus of the uh, Taliban takeover. So I would hope that we are putting past grievances aside and consulting very closely with the Pakistanis and with other states that will be affected by this uh, to figure out how, how we can best reduce the threat. We have a number of questions about the Northern Alliance Someone said, uh, well, it's William Finoff says, Isn't a, is there a version of the Northern Alliance 2.0? And then we also had a question about uh, Ahmed Massoud, who is, uh, in, I'll let you go into explanation about who he is and how unfortunately his father was killed two days before 9-11 by a Tunisian feigning as a journalist. Yeah, it's, uh, as they say, really complicated out there. So it's not the Northern Alliance 2.0. Uh, it would be the Northern Alliance uh, minus 2.0. Uh, as we have just seen, what Northern Alliance? Uh, the Northern Alliance composed mainly of um, non-Pashtuns, Tajiks and, and Uzbeks, uh, were able to hold on to um, the Northeast uh, area of Pakistan uh, uh, when the Taliban ruled. The Taliban were never able to take about 25% of the country because uh, Northern Alliance could, could hold it. Well, if you're kind of watching the Taliban march, uh, they concentrated on the North as uh, early steps, um, uh, taking capitals, um, uh, taking control of borders and so forth. Not a shot fired at them, from the old Northern Alliance militia because it just isn't there anymore. Uh, will it uh, somehow re-emerge in the face of uh, Taliban occupation and its uh, Taliban policies that are antithetical to uh, many non-Pashtun as well as Pashtun Afghans? We'll have to wait and see. But uh, what was there uh, and was crucial to us uh, in the fight against the Taliban in 2001, just not there anymore. We've seen over the last 48, 72 hours, a few pockets of resistance to the Taliban, uh, people carrying Afghan flags and so forth. And William Pollock asked this question, 
mentioning the videos and he says, why does the Taliban continue to dominate when one might think that there's more Afghans who could just stand up and resist them? Well, it's easy to say in the drawing rooms of Santa Fe, I suppose, uh, a little harder to do if you're on the streets of Kabul. And the amount of courage these individuals shown, they were not brandishing weapons. Again, they were brandishing flags, uh, can't be overstated. Uh, so the Taliban broke up those uh, uh, small events. Uh, I don't think they killed anybody, uh, but uh, uh, some pretty sound beatings seem to be administered. Uh, well, you know, again, we will see what happens. Uh, the Afghans are people of uh, uh, great strength and resilience, uh, wherever they are on which side of the battle. Uh, and, and it may be that we will see a, um, uh, an, an effort to build up an internal resistance to the Taliban. Uh, the Taliban know that too, of course. Uh, and uh, I think we'll be pretty intent in sending the message, don't even think about it. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see even more um, uh, summary executions. This is uh, something that troubles me greatly. Uh, you mentioned uh, No One Left Behind, a nonprofit that, uh, uh, of which I'm a, an advisory board member, dedicated solely to getting to safety those who served us as interpreters and in other functions. Uh, uh, that's a real rough one because for these interpreters to get to the airport, they have to pass Taliban checkpoints. Uh, and so what do they say when the Talibs say, why are you going to the airport? Uh, they're not, uh, there are no commercial flights. Do they produce their file and say, oh no, the Americans are taking care of me because I work with them against you and they know that uh, you're gonna kill me if you catch me, uh, so that's why I'm here. Well, I don't think that's gonna happen. How do they get to the airport? And this would be a, uh, a relatively small issue, not for the people concerned. The enormity of the disaster that two American presidents, presidents have, have uh, uh, ladled on to the Afghan people and to our own national security, it, it's kind of hard to fathom. Uh, we have handed the country back to the people who brought about 9-11. Uh, they're not kinder and gentler. They're not really looking forward to someday selling insurance in, in Minnesota. Um, uh, it, this is not hypothetical, that this is where it happened. A and yet we had two presidents uh, determined and taking the actions that have brought us to where we are today, uh, which is a pretty awful place. So, and I, I, I suspect you'll probably be called before Congress given your experience and knowledge. And I'm sure we're gonna have so many different types of commissions and investigations. And one question will certainly be, what was the impact of closing Bagram base with so little advance notice on, I think it was July 5th, and what has been suggested is by removing that air power that that gave the Taliban the ability to move so quickly. Yet the Taliban had been making advances over the last several years. So how do you reconcile those two positions? Uh, I guess in short, what I'm asking is how serious, what was the impact of closing Bagram the way we did? It, it was part and parcel of uh, 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 basically a capitulation strategy on, on our part that uh, really hung the Afghan government, uh, uh, the Afghan military, the Afghan people, uh, especially women and children, hung them out to dry. Um, there wasn't even a formal chain, change of command uh, involving the Afghans. Uh, there was a change of command that's legally required in, in the US military whereby General Miller relinquished authority to the commander of Central Command in Florida. Um, the uh, Afghan security forces didn't even know what was happening, including those at Bagram. So frankly, this is a, you know, it is a shameful uh, self-administered defeat on the part of the United States uh, that has uh, created a set of elements that 
will be playing out for years and years to come. Ryan, are one... NATO allies now? No, our NATO allies are absolutely furious. Uh, uh, the, uh, President Biden has out-trumped Trump. Uh, you may recall that um, he did not inform NATO when he cut our force levels from 5,000 to 2,500 at the end of his presidency. Um, and then of course, Biden's gone further. He pulling us all out with no notification of NATO uh, who are now in a desperate scramble to get their own people out. Uh, so for the president who said, um, America is back. America is back as a global leader. We are going to prioritize diplomacy. We are going to lead as we have led in the past. Uh, well, not exactly. Uh, again, uh, it's hard to imagine a, a more catastrophic policy for our own interests uh, than the one that President Trump um, initiated and that President Biden has embraced. We talk about the 2,500 American troops, but Ambassador Kay Bailey Hutchison, who was uh, our ambassador, U.S. ambassador to NATO in, in Brussels and was extremely successful and well-regarded, she always stressed in her speeches and writings that those 2,500 actually leveraged and brought in another 7,500. I gather then that all of those troops left when we are left as well. Well, again, uh, uh, yes and no, like, uh, like we have had to do, uh, initially at least, additional troops are, are coming in to uh, protect citizens of their countries and to transport them hopefully to, to safety. I mean, uh, <clears throat> you know, instead of taking out 2,500 troops to end our military presence in, in Kabul, uh, President Biden has had to insert about 6,000 more troops. Uh, instead of um, highlighting the airport, right? I mean, they're not the providing airport. any security to the to the country. Absolutely not. No, they're there specifically to um, facilitate the evacuation of our citizens. And if there's time um, and money, maybe we'll do something for some of those people who supported us and will now pay with their lives. Uh, president hasn't seemed too interested in that either. Uh, so again, we we have. Um, it, Really, with one stroke of the pen, uh, uh, he has increased the threat to um, Afghanistan's neighbors, to ourselves, uh, by allowing uh, a chain of events to unfold that brings back the Taliban and underneath them, Al Qaeda. Um, uh, he has done the exact opposite of rebuilding alliances. Uh, and he has been totally unapologetic for any of it. Um, you know, uh, not, not, not a great start for our commander in chief. So Kathy Kinney, and we've touched on this, but I'd like you to maybe elaborate some more. She asked about the air power. And so by closing Bagram, uh, essentially we just decapitated the Afghan military forces ability to guard the skies. Is that correct? Well, the Afghan air force uh, is totally dependent on American contractors uh, to stay in the air. Uh, these are sophisticated platforms. Uh, they can't maintain them. However, it's in the contract. Uh, these contractors left when we left. Uh, so the, the Afghan uh, Air Force was left with uh, planes they could not sustain. Again, uh, uh, President Trump uh, really broke the will of the Afghan uh, National Security Forces. Uh, he forced the government to release 5,000 Taliban prisoners uh, who immediately joined the fight against the government and against Afghan security forces. And then, of course, President Biden blames the collapse of the uh, security forces on the situation. Uh, we're not going to fight for them if they won't fight for themselves. And look, I, I'm a diplomat. I choose my words carefully or try to. This is contemptible. Uh, I, Jim, I don't think you were uh, you, you saw this when you were there with the delegation, but every week in Kabul, there would be a, a short solemn ceremony at International Security Assistance Force headquarters in which the names of the dead for the week would be read aloud. There were always some Americans, sadly. It was, it was tough to listen to. 
more rarely there would be uh, casualties from coalition from NATO partners, their names would be read. The last person to come to the microphone was an Afghan military officer. He, he didn't read names. He recited a number, 153, 137, on and on it went. The number of Afghan soldiers and police killed in the fight that week. Um, and for President Biden now to say, uh, if they won't fight for themselves, why should we even be there? Uh, again, is contemptible. Well, I remember you started your country, your weekly country meetings by making mention of those who had passed or who had been killed as, as, as well. Let's talk for a minute about how we could have something so screwed up. And I think that's a nice way to say it is the special immigration visa. And from that, go on and tell us about the good work that you and General Petraeus and others have have tried to do and how successful have you been? Well, no one loved, uh, no one left behind uh, was, was formed purely to try to bring those who served us to safety. Uh, there is a process, special immigrant visa process uh, uh, to do that. It is cumbersome, slow, 14 steps on the average. It took three years uh, for a person to get a visa uh, after he applied for it. Uh, so we've been pounding away on that for quite a while. For God's sake, simplify the process, drop some of this stuff. Because even without the Taliban controlling the country, uh, uh, they were able to track down and kill uh, a number of these interpreters, uh, perhaps as many as 300 over the years. Uh, so uh, we, we had banged away on that. We got, uh, we've made some headway in Congress. This was before, of course, the Taliban takeover uh, uh, in, in reducing and simplifying these, uh, these procedures. Uh, now, of course, uh, we're, we're focused in a different manner. Uh, we're doing everything we can to, to um, help those who helped us get to the airport and get to safety. And I, I got to tell you, Jim, I mean, uh, when, I, when I wake up in the morning and turn on my phone, uh, every morning, you know, there are a whole lot of messages from very desperate Afghans saying, help me, help me get out, help my family get out. Uh, so it's been a... What do you advise them, Ryan? Uh, what I advise them is to be sure that uh, they have followed some of the uh, online linkages uh, so that uh, the uh, State Department staff still out at the airport knows they're there uh, and then sit tight. Uh, when, 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 we're, when we're set, we'll, we'll send you a notice. We don't want these folks uh, having to make that dangerous run to the airport and then uh, not be able to, to access uh, access a flight. Uh, we've also taken another step since, um, since our government has been so derelict in this whole process. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, <clears throat> we did a charter of our own that uh, flew out today um, uh, to, <clears throat> to, to get some of our guys uh, to safety since uh, Washington doesn't seem overly concerned about that. Well, damn it, we are. And we, we're, we're doing what we can. Maybe it'll look a little like the famous Dunkirk uh, evacuation, where you know so everything. We we sent uh, links to people oh, that, that they can support. No one left behind and other organizations. Um, if I were more uh, technically savvy, I'd put that up. But I don't want to interrupt our conversation. But we have sent that to you, and we've put a number of uh, charities and agencies, and want to encourage people to to support those right now. Chris Montano says, Germany and other countries are using their special forces to uh, outside the airport to rescue their citizens and those who have helped their embassies. Why are we so reluctant to do that? And, and I'll add, you think we'll get to that point where we will be sending people to rescue uh, those who have worked so closely with us. So um, we're the Americans and that is different than anybody else. Uh, I think in this particular context, it means that uh, other, other countries can indeed do what some are doing, including the Germans, of uh, 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 using their forces to reach and then to evacuate uh, under guard uh, their own citizens. 
uh, it would be rather different if we tried it to say the least um, uh, and likely could trigger a um, significant outbreak of violence. Uh, we're all products of our own histories and mine was formed in part in the, um, the fire and ashes of, of uh, Lebanon in 1982-83 when I was political counselor. There, the Marines um, uh, uh, had a, an undefined mission of undefined duration uh, and paid for it with many of their lives. The bombing of the Marine barracks in October 1983 killed 245 Marines. Uh, so I think we've got to be really careful uh, uh, of how far we go and what we do outside the uh, the airport perimeter, because again, we are the Americans. It's uh, uh, one thing for the Germans to do a little uh, uh, effort to get some of their folks out. Uh, it would be in a much larger context for us. And uh, uh, we would have to think through that, I think, uh, very, very carefully. So Evelyn Early, a former diplomat, a retired diplomat. Hey, you know, Evelyn. <laughs> I think, Ed, let me read her whole question. As you know, Afghans who work for small US NGOs and are, are then eligible for P2 visas must travel to a third country first. I'm getting emails, she sa or says, from American colleagues desperate to evacuate their employees. Somewhere I saw that the USG might revise procedures for NGO journalists and other non-official Afghanis who may face reprisals from the Taliban. Do you know anything about this? Well, I have um, advised my government just to tear up the damn rule book. Uh, uh, the humanitarian parole process uh, is designed to take care of uh, folks in Afghanistan that haven't worked directly for the US government, but that have worked as journalists in programs we support, that have been civil society activists, a lot of women in that category. And what we're saying is, uh, you know, forget about again all the boxes they got to check. Uh, you know, get them out, uh, and we can check the boxes later. Well, that hadn't moved real quick, uh, to to say the least. And uh, here again, you're you're seeing um, others take this into their own hands. I mean, the New York Times uh, yesterday a chartered plane and uh, flew. Washington Post did the same thing. Exactly because. Boy, oh boy, you don't want to wait for Uncle Joe Biden to get around to this. Um, uh, he didn't have much interest in it. So again, and that also motivated our own flight from uh, no one left behind. Uh, it, it is, boy, you know, the, the ruinous policies of two presidents who, who brought us this. And then in the case of President Biden, he seems to be dwelling on a different planet as all of these bad things go down that he caused to happen. One of the things I was thinking about earlier today is that when I saw that Washington Post and New York Times had evacuated their staffs, and I suspect they're American reporters, if not, it will soon, we're not going to be getting any reports, except I guess through social media and they'll, Taliban could block that, I, I, I guess. Yeah, it, it'll be uh, very interesting to see what uh, happens with the, uh, uh, the international, largely American media presence now in, uh, in Kabul. Uh, these are, uh, they are not exactly the enemies of the American people, as uh, President Trump tried to style them. These are uh, hugely committed and courageous folks who are out there to get a big story right. And I think many of them are, would have to be drugged, uh, kicking and screaming uh, from Afghanistan at this point. They know how high the stakes are and they know how important it is to have uh, comprehensive, accurate reports literally from the front lines. There are a number of questions and one or two are pushing back a little bit with you about talking about Al-Qaeda reestablishing itself. And isn't it in the Taliban's interest, especially what happened in 2002, not to let Al-Qaeda or other terrorist groups uh, incubate in Afghanistan? Well, look, with respect, uh, you know, try and learn a little bit about, if you can't do ancient history, at least try modern history. Uh, you know, after 9-11, we, we presented an ultimatum to the Taliban that effectively said, you give us Al-Qaeda and uh, we'll leave you alone. Uh, the Taliban refused. 
they, they chose uh, defeat and exile rather than give up their allies. Uh, it meant that much to them. Uh, so no, uh, they, uh, they didn't learn that lesson from 2002. They learned the opposite one. Uh, uh, stick with your allies uh, and they will stick with you. So uh, again, if you want to bet America's security on it, you can always say, as President Biden seems to be saying, oh, that was then, this is now. That, that couldn't possibly happen again. Really? I mean, these are the same guys who did it. Uh, and again, they, they, uh, they wandered in the wilderness for 20 years. And so as not to give up on Al-Qaeda. So. so Ambassador Vicki Huddleston asks, um, one, I think we've already answered one of her questions and that was, can the Taliban effectively govern the country? But her other question was, what role do you see for the United States government playing with the Taliban? Um, and will Al-Qaeda and ISIS be given safe haven? Uh, and, and I think I'd like to ex ask you to expand on that as a diplomat, what has to happen for us to recognize the Taliban? Well, right now, um, that's of course the farthest thing from our mind. Uh, uh, we moved uh, immediately to freeze Afghan assets in the United States, mostly held by the Fed, the New York Fed. Uh, and it's a lot of it's a lot of dough, uh, so uh, we we have clamped down on that. Um, uh, we are actively uh, pushing a policy of non recognition of the Taliban. Uh, what we're we having given away all of our leverage to get to this point, uh, it seems like we're trying to claw a little of it back. Uh, if we if, uh, if if we're holding Af. Afghanistan's financial resources, and if we're able to uh, uh, stop a move to normalize relations with the Taliban, then we got something to bargain with uh, as, as we move on down the line here. Uh, but uh, without the Taliban not just talking about a different approach, but demonstrating a different approach on the ground on issues of governance and treatment of minorities, treatment of females, uh, unless or until that happens on a broad scale. Uh, we need to be looking for all the ways we can to make, um, uh, to make their lives and their efforts at governance to be as difficult as we can make them. Let's talk about the role of the embassy and the State Department. Um, how many State Department officers or employees did we have in Kabul? May have been up to 1,400. Is that too many? Well, it's, uh, the question isn't too many, it's to do what? Um, uh, well, once the uh, unspooling uh, of Afghanistan started, uh, there wasn't a whole lot that a, a lot of these uh, people could do. And uh, we started drawing down uh, beginning, I think, uh, way back in June, it seems like an infinity ago. Uh, we are down to a, a very small cadre right now uh, but like the military, we have also sent uh, people into the fight uh, to, uh, to help with the effort of processing evacuees out, out there at the airport, working with our, our military and under the leadership of some very fine and, and um, uh, very brave American uh, foreign service officers. A number of questions. And, and Ryan, I got to tell you, I've never seen so many questions on a webinar. Uh, we have over 50 that are still open. Um, so I didn't, need, I, need, I didn't need to prepare any questions, um, but a number of them, and excuse me uh, for combining these, uh, but Neil says, let's assume that we were going to withdraw. What, how should we have done it? How should the US have ended our presence in Afghanistan? And was ending that necessary? Uh, well, that is a, uh, an excellent question, it's two in one. Obviously, I'll start with the, the, uh, the second part, uh, which no, it was not necessary. Uh, this was a self-inflicted wound that uh, uh, President Biden, for whatever reasons, felt compelled to, uh, uh, to do. Uh, had we, again, approached this in a responsible, mature, and studied way, uh, it would have involved uh, conversations, of course, uh, primarily with the Afghan government, 
uh, we got to draw a line somewhere and we're going to do it. What do we need to do to give you, put you in the best position going forward? Uh, that would have meant uh, a number of things. I think most uh, importantly, a reconfiguration of uh, Afghan national security forces. Uh, we unfortunately built a military to look like ours, uh, uh, reliant on high technology, uh, reliant on mobility, uh, reliant on supporting fires from the air, uh, none of which survived. Uh, we would not have released or forced them to release 5,000 Taliban prisoners. We would have said, in effect, here's what we think, what do you think, how do you want to reposition here? Uh, and we would have worked with uh, certainly our NATO allies to, to get their advice and uh, counsel since they were in it with us. Uh, uh, we would have been convening NGOs to figure out what um, kind of aid delivery might be possible post US military. Uh, again, it was a unnecessary and a very bad decision to do a complete withdrawal. But even if he was fixed on it, uh, uh, he could have done uh, a series of consultations that might have left us with a much better situation than we're facing right now. Let's talk a, a bit about the role of just how much money we we put into Afghanistan. I mean, it's amazing numbers. I read today that it was something like 36 billion just on trying to improve its its governance. And there is the SIGAR reports, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, which all of you can find online. And there were really strong warnings that I think you would agree were ignored by our policymakers. And certainly President Biden did not read that report. How do you, when you read those reports that come out monthly and quarterly, what do you think about? Well, again, um, uh, Afghanistan is not like Iraq in some pretty basic aspects. Uh, the reason we went into Afghanistan, of course, was uh, because of 9-11. Uh, and we were there uh, after the Taliban refused the ultimatum and had been deposed. Uh, our mission there was to ensure that Afghan soil was never again a staging area for attacks on the American homeland. I mean, that was pretty, pretty clear to all of us at the time. And I recall uh, uh, six months after 9-11, uh, on, on uh, the 11th of March, 2002, um, we had a ceremony around the embassy flagpole uh, uh, to mark the um, uh, placing underground of a fragment of the World Trade Center, uh, the opposite end of ground zero, as it were. So uh, we were never, uh, at, at my level, we were never in doubt of why we were there. It wasn't about nation building. Uh, it was about American security. Now, what's the best way to guarantee that security? And that's what leads you into conversations about, well, what do you do to help create a more stable Afghanistan. Some of the things we did, I'm very proud of. Um, education, particularly education for girls, uh, the journalism programs that, that we got going, so there would be a free yet responsible press, things like that. Uh, other things like high tech, very expensive brick and mortar facilities, uh, not such a bright idea. Uh, but I just wanna underscore that uh, first, last, and always, our, our reason for being there was the security of our own country. It does seem the commander-in-chief may have kind of let that thought wander away from him. Let me just show, I don't know if people, I, I don't think you can see the graph, uh, but this, it does show, this came out today from the Council on Foreign Relations, showing that in 2002, there were basically zero percent, zero girls in school. In 2018, there were just over 80% uh, girls in primary school ages 7 to 12 in secondary school it looks like it was just around 40 percent um <clears throat> ray termini from dallas asked this you keep speaking ambassador crocker of trump and biden what about george w bush's decision to move the focus of u.s troops to iraq rather than finish the job in afghanistan some commentators have said the war was lost when that decision was made. I suspect you've answered that question a few times, but let's hear it. Yeah, yeah. 
well, version 8.0. Uh, look, uh, so I was, I was there at the beginning. Uh, at that beginning, we had something called Operation Anaconda the first few days of March uh, 2002, in which we had identified a significant concentration of Al-Qaeda uh, way up in the Northeastern mountains. Uh, so we went after them. Uh, uh, it turned out to be a substantial struggle uh, that we, we had to bring in armor and uh, it, it, it was a tougher fight than we, uh, than we had expected. But we also noticed something else. Uh, uh, there were Afghans trying to cross through our lines, uh, but they weren't trying to cross through our lines to get out of the fight. They were crossing to get into it. And that for me was a kind of an initial uh-oh moment. Uh, uh, what happens when you get a little farther down the line on this and these folks have uh, regrouped? Uh, again, um, uh, what, we, what, we, what we saw there uh, also, I think, underscored the fact that we were not an occupying power. We never were, not legally and not practically, very, very unlike Iraq, where we were both legally and, and factually. Um, when I got there, I wanted to know who was there in the American uniform. Exactly one organized um, a combat element, uh, uh, a Marine Brigade uh, battalion landing team down in the South. That was it. Uh, we had special operators, uh, other specialized units and so forth, uh, but it was a very light footprint. And I think that was very important because it sent the signal by our military absence that we were not there to occupy the country. Uh, we were there to support an interim government uh, from a United Nations uh, sponsored uh, conference that took place in Bonn in December of um, 01. Now, um, had we decided to have a whole lot more forces there, my guess is it would have accelerated the insurgency, mm. uh, not, uh, uh, not slowed it down because the Taliban were never in a great position to argue, they, they would say it, American occupier, but you read those words if you're an Afghan and you look around you saying, geez, I wish there were some occupying forces here uh, to, to make me feel better. So uh, very often in the broader Middle East, it's not a good choice versus a bad choice. It's bad choices and worse choices. Mm -hmm. um, I think had we decided to up our military presence in Afghanistan, we would have accelerated the insurgency. Hmm. We have just another minute or two, and let me go back to Ambassador Huddleston, who Ryan says what two or three other people have said too. Thank you for your honest and comprehensive comments, which alas are spot on. She worries, however, that this whole process undermines Biden when the alternative is still Trump, who was much worse. Well, yeah, again, uh, one thing I don't spend a lot of time about is speculating on American politics and fail to understand it utterly. Uh, 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 but again, the, uh, I, I think anyone looking at this uh, uh, at all objectively uh, can, can see that uh, there really is no way that President Trump's going to be able to make any hay out of this. Uh, President Biden or President Trump. President Trump. Trump. Uh, yeah, this is not benefiting. <laughs> Look, I've been on Fox uh, uh, a couple times now in the last few days, you know, making the point that, that, that it was Trump who started this march to hell uh, and, and the steps that he took, particularly forcing the release of those Taliban prisoners, that's what caused the unraveling of the government and the Afghan National Security Forces. Was, was, no was President Biden about. obligated to, to stand by that agreement that President of Trump course, made? Of course he wasn't. Yeah. Not a bit. Uh, and again, uh, you know, look, I'll, I'll betray some of my own biases. I've known uh, President Biden for years, and I've always, I've always respected and admired him. Uh, he, he knew how the world works. He, he was a fair-minded guy. He would, uh, you know, when I was in Iraq as ambassador and we were getting set for those September 2007 hearings on the war, uh, he, he came out to Iraq just to test his own assumptions. And it, he changed his mind on a, a few points because he'd been there. 
So I am stunned <clears throat> by what he's doing now, even more stunned given the dream team that he's assembled around him. These are all people we know uh, who've been in the business, who, who have good judgment and so forth. Uh, so, so I can't figure it out. I mean, Biden, it would be like Trump saying, gee, I think the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear agreement is a terrible agreement, but well, you know, my predecessor signed it. So there it is. Are I mean, you being consulted? Say again? Are you being consulted? Oh, I, you know, I have the unique distinction. I was just thinking about it. I am not on speaking terms with this administration, just as I was not on speaking terms with the previous administration, uh, given their diametrically opposed natures. That ain't bad. Well, I'll say this, Ambassador Crocker, who shares my tie. I'm glad we're on speaking terms. Thanks, thanks so much for spending. I know how busy you are. I'm glad that you took time to be with us rather than CNN or Fox. So thanks a lot. Well, Any yeah, last words, Ryan? Yeah, just let me say one thing. You alluded to the uh, World Affairs Council mission that uh, Maria Zamet put together and that you were part of that came to uh, Afghanistan. <laughs> uh, uh, I had done a similar thing in Iraq, again, that uh, Maria put together a, uh, a, a leadership delegation uh, because I wanted them to come out to Iraq and to Afghanistan. Uh, you are the, by far the largest and most influential uh, uh, grassroots uh, uh, effort in this country to bring an understanding of the world to, to the American people. Uh, having you come out uh, and others come out before in Iraq, uh, I, I made those invitations and worked to get you there uh, because of the regard I have for the World Affairs Council. When you do a mission like this, it's serious stuff. You do reports, they are objective. Uh, they are not influenced by the government. So all of you out there who are paying your dues, but even more importantly, all of you out there who aren't, because you haven't joined yet, uh, join your nearest World Affairs Council um, entity, it will be an investment in America's future. Thank you, Ryan. In fact, I see Carla McConnell wrote, fabulous, I'm going to join the SFCR. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Ryan. Want to remind everybody that we'll be back on next Thursday, the State of the State Department. I have a feeling that Vicki Huddleston, Esquino, and the others, they, they are rewriting their remarks probably this week than what they had planned to say a few weeks ago. Ryan, keep up, keep, keep up the fight, and we'll see all of you very soon here at the Santa Fe Council on International Relations. Have a good evening and a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.